way too cold for me. <laughs> Uh, so I lived in um, New Haven so oh. for New London, and, and I guess, more specifically. My husband. Are you working still? No. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not too familiar. I stayed uh, southern the Navy. I was uh, staying at Lincoln Robbins, Connecticut. Uh -huh, uh, which is on the coast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about 10 minutes from Rhode Island. Yeah. And, yep, it is. <laughs> got to see your students and stuff. Yes, the original I've never been to this bookshop either. I am absolutely staying in the Oh, it's wonderful. He also has, like, after our today. Water's the good stuff. <laughs> Glass water? No? Hey, sweetie. 
Uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, yeah. 8 to 10. I like to start early. I'm sorry, 8 to 12. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, 8 to 10 a.m. You know, office hours after that, but uh, it's a pretty good schedule. Two separate sections? Three. Three sections, yeah, and two, two different. Uh, two, two are literature classes, and then uh, uh, one is uh, uh, freshman composition. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I'm I'm pretty loud. Well, just that I'll cut probably going through this. Okay. I want to see if this is. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. hear coming through the speakers. Okay. So I'm going to make sure to do that. Okay. Hello, hello. Oh, great. Hi. All right. Hi. You can spread this back um, a little bit more. So we're doing it starting next week. Oh, there's a couple front row seats. We're going to start just a couple minutes. So your time is good. After you completed the book and as of when it was called Financial Presidency. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, yeah, this is a great group. Thank you all. Thank you. Whenever uh, Eric gives me the green light, we'll go. Excellent. Okay. I'm glad you can pronounce great before we dig anything. <laughs> in amor everything everything is great you know right you know yeah well it's a good sign mm -hmm. yeah. if we had 60 people here it might be a little tight you know I did something last month at the mission campus and we had not expected it to get too big but it actually it got pretty filled up oh. it was at the uh, library um for at the city college campus, uh -huh. and, and you know a, a lot a lot of people came through. It was good, That's good great. energy, That's good great. energy. But then intimate settings are always wonderful too, you know, right? Yeah. Everybody gets to chime in. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we haven't started yet, so I. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't chimed in yet. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll prepare. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So again, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you all for coming out. Are you all in the book group that no, Joan leads at the rec center? Except this gentleman is uh, his student. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Oh. Wow. At, at City. Yeah. yeah. What, in a writing class or a uh, English one A? Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. How long have you been teaching? Twenty two years. Ah, over okay. at City. Yeah. 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 yeah I, and I told Eric this the other day. The first place where I taught was at a school where I had been kicked out of a dozen years earlier. <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember Woodrow Wilson High School? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the high schools that I went to. Yeah, okay, yeah. Ben. Yeah, 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 room, yeah, yeah. And now it's called Philip Burton. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that's where I was at. That was back in 98 when I started teaching over there. It was only a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll get our, our stray audience member. Here she comes back, and then we'll get this rolling. All right. okay. Were any faculty still there? Any of the okay. teachers still there that had been there? There, there was a principal at that time. Her name was uh, Miss Howell. And so she was doing some work, uh, um, either at Wilson or at Bur I went to Burbank, the middle school. So, um, right. you, you know, yeah. she, she had been around, and by that time she was the principal. You know, right? Did she yeah. remember you? She did not remember me. Yeah, yeah. I was mostly out, out, out in the parking lot. You know, and yeah, that's. Yeah. 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 All right. I think we'll go ahead and get this rolling, right? I don't have any introduction prepared. Joan probably knows more than I do. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
Ben is the author of those two very great books, um, Mario Bushido and uh, Anna Moore, uh, I'm sorry, Pura Neta. Pura Neta, that's right. Yeah, but this is a more analysis. You'll find out. So yeah. thank you, Ben. Hey. Have, have a nice time. All right, all right. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you all for coming by, you know, and I offer and share amor to all of you, right? Um, uh, I am not expecting to lecture right now or offer any type of critical solution to anything. You know, the only evidence I have is inside of my heart. And these are just spider symbols. I say them, they make webs, you know what I mean, right? You know, and uh, um, I'm offering today a more analysis. It's something that I played around with language, but also with philosophy and the own, my own feeling inside of my heart. And amor analysis, what is it, right? Uh, it, it is literary deconstruction for the purpose of interpreting and emanating amor, which is love, which is love, right? And so if, if you know, anything happens here today, this is it, this is it, you know? I have no grand solution or anything. Sharing some literature, I'm so happy that you all have joined me for this. Um, and, and so I would like to actually read a little bit of writing first before I go into the texts. I'd like to read from the latest project that I've been working on uh, for, for about maybe the past year. I've been working on Amor Analysis, okay? And so th this is um, a section from it. And so I'll, I'll, I'll read. <clears throat> I do not need to have a political point, economic idea, philosophical fantasy, and or solution to anything. These spider symbols are simply all lies once they are spun into sticky webs. I have taken part in lies all my life, and they have gotten me nowhere except the hell of mass manipulation that then even poisons inside of me. If I must do something, anything with these words, I let them try to offer and share amor. Amor analysis, once again, is literary deconstruction for the purpose of interpreting and emanating amor. We do not know what life is or where or when it begins or ends. Nor do we know what death is, or where or when it begins or ends. We have no idea of time. All we know are moments upon moments. And we do not even know that. We fantasize about words and meaning while it is all vanishing in front of us. Life, death. I don't understand those things. And ultimately, I don't care about those things. I know now, even though I don't know now, I am here. We are here. And the best of all of this right now is in amor, a state of being, a miracle that puts you in the moment forever, which is only the specific moment. It doesn't matter where you are 
or when anything began or ended. If you want to call it eternal life, go ahead. But I think amor is enough. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening, right? And we'll discuss amor analysis in more depth. Well, once I'm done talking a little bit about each one of these texts, and maybe I guess a little bit regarding my journey, you know, right? And so this is, I'll, I'll talk about my writer's journey right now. I'll, we'll see what, what you all want to talk about after I, I talk a little bit about this. This was my first published novel back in 2011, publisher out of Berkeley, <clears throat> El Leon Literary Arts. And... Um, I wrote, I wrote it, it's a fictionalized story, really, really about San Francisco. Uh, uh, San Francisco in the 80s and early 90s. And this is when mass incarceration was really in full bloom. You know, my brother was inside of prison. My friends were all going to prison, you know, or would be dead. My, bro my brother lived and died on the streets. And um, when, when he died in 2008, that's when I said, you know, uh, you know, I, I had written this previously, but I didn't, I didn't consider publishing it. And, and then, then I said, you know, in, in his honor, I need to do something. And so, you know, I dedicated this, this book to my brother. And uh, the story is about three homeboys who feel they have fallen from the grace of God. And now they're trying to find some kind of meaning in this existence. One meaning that one of the characters, Lobo, one of the meanings that he finds is a full-fledged philosophy. It was the philosophy of the streets. Vida loca. Vida loca. Which means, anyone? Crazy life. Crazy life. Crazy life. So I will read from page, um, I think this is page 30 or 31, and uh, page 30, and this is Lobo. <clears throat> Vida loca, crazy life, the homeboy philosophy, my philosophy, because it didn't make any sense to do the shit that I did, but it did make sense. It made me normal in a world where I had to fuck a motherfucker up to feel good inside, to be accepted by the locos, to keep my respect as a man. I had to get over on someone and make them feel like shit so that I could say I was a true street soldier. I couldn't justify or explain it. It went beyond justification. It went beyond the simplicity of an explanation. There was no explanation or theory that could satisfy the lust of la vida loca. All I knew is that I was there. And I had to do what I had to do to keep the little piece of planet that was the barrio mine. Reality is what counted. And it is what was strong. The crazy life was reality. As real and genuine as the crazy death. That was Lobo. That was Lobo. Later on in the novel, a character named Santo, because of Vida Loca, he knows he's going to die. He's going to sacrifice himself for the homies. <clears throat> and he understands it. He accepts it. He's jogging. And he has an epiphany about what he wants to do on the last day of his life. 
I'm going to read that to you right now. This is a character named Santo, which means saint. Uh, this is on page 216, pages 216 to 217 in uh, Barrio Bushido. <clears throat> the homeboys are philosophers. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> you have a third person narrator here speaking. As he jogged, he thought about life, the beautiful moments of meeting Mari, winning a fight, hogging on a humongous piece of pie. But now his mortality beckoned and he considered his mistakes. Where had he gone wrong? At what point had he made that irreversible turn into fucked up alley? What was the hour and exact minute of the point of no return? It was going to be in one second. For in one second, at exactly 4.14 p.m., he reached the liquor store down the block from the shack and an obscene thought overcame him. He would write it down. He would die. There was no doubt about that. But he would leave his legacy so that others could learn. He would write it out so that it had to be true. Santo would research the furthest depths of his soul because he had to leave a legacy behind him. He would write what should never be written or spoken about. And he would not burn it this time. He would not repeat a manifesto of the mind. He, wo he would instead weave a history for his people who had no history. He would write it then he would force himself to die. Santo did not know what mattered. He questioned the world, what truly counted. And then he pulled out a short summary of life that he had kept from his previous manifesto. He meditated and then began something new. Mine was not to question. His hours numbered. Santo knew that only the true story needed to be told. It was his voice and then it wasn't. Then everything became a blur and he did not know whether he was writing the story or whether the story was writing him. Santo did not know if it was past, present or future only that it was perhaps eternal, forever, never ending, never before, never again. It calmed him. It helped him accept what would happen because after it was written down, it could never be taken back for writing from the heart required a dedication, a pact, an oath that could never be broken. That is Santo, that is Santo from Barrio Bushido. Okay, thank you once again for listening and I can't thank you enough for allowing me to share my voice with you. So uh, th this was the first novel and the second novel, is Pura Neta. <clears throat> this was published a couple of years ago, actually in the year 2020, this was published, and it's actually a sequel of Barrio Bushido. And so Pura Neta begins where Barrio Bushido ends. At the end of Barrio Bushido and the beginning of Pura Neta, Lobo, one of the characters I introduced you to, who survives Barrio Bushido, 
he values an up and coming young homeboy. He's the young homeboy is 16 years old at the time. And Lobo decides to kick him out of the gang so that the young man could have his own freedom. He gives him some cash and he tells him to take off. And at the beginning of Pura Neta, Cartoon has come back after 20 years away from the Mission Vario. And so by this time, Lobo is serving life in prison. And what I'm about to read from you is in the middle of, of the book. <clears throat> Finally, Cartoon is able to visit. I'm sorry. Yes, Cartoon is able to visit Lobo in prison. And so I will read. Uh, this is um, page... Uh, let's see, page 128, 128, <clears throat> and be before I read, I'll drink a little bit, <laughs> hey, thank you all for your attention, all right, and, and you, you know, I do want to engage with you all, so, so th this part will only be maybe about 10 more minutes in length, and I'd really love to hear your energy, your ideas, any questions you have, you know, I, 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 I I'm here, I hope we're here to share uh, our more analysis, okay? All right, so here we go. <clears throat> In his sharp prison blues uniform, <clears throat> Lobo sat on a steel stool, breathed into the prison phone, and looked past the bulletproof glass at, our, at cartoon who was no longer a runt, but a tough, full-fledged man, a homeboy who understood the look of death. Lobo had imagined this conversation 20 years earlier when he kicked Cartoon out and predicted one day he would return. Now in 2012, there was no need for explanations or apologies, no need for salutations. Slim and fit Lobo smiled and started spitting. The future funk is not yet defined, but corruption started it all off and ain't going nowhere no matter how evolved we pretend to be. Shit, evolution makes us worse. Lobo scratched at the fleas in his crotch. If you ain't got the guts to first and foremost and constantly admit that this world is rooted in inconsistency and dishonesty, depravity and perversion, then, motherfucker, we can't even have an intelligent conversation. So excuse me while I kick it in this corner and play dumb dunce, a camouflaged gorilla, the ultimate gangster, an American icon, a rebel, Undercover, but honest, even in deception. One goal is all that matters. Familia. Not the corruption of the gang, but real family in its finest form. Children. Future. Amor. The gangster knows the sham and doesn't try to fix what can't be fixed. Practical, realistic. He knows you must steal your bread. He knows you must hustle your life. The good things are not sins. Wine 
and whiskey, laughter, lust, freedom. But the freedom for what? <clears throat> to live life the way he wants. Like the gorilla camouflaged, the gangster fights his battles in darkness. He believes in honor, accepts deception and death without crime. For 35 years, Vincent the Chin Gigante, Genevieve's family godfather in pajamas, bathrobe and slippers, tottered through the New York streets and federal prisons, feigning insanity, keeping it all together. The boss. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, 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 so some of you may not know this story. Uh, thank you, thank you. Vincent the Chin, anyone know the story? So Vincent the Chin Gigante was the boss of the Genovese crime family, uh, uh, one of the five families in New York. And it was a very famous thing. I was always captivated by this. For 35 years, he acted insane and would walk around the streets like walking like this and a gangster would hold him like this and they, to, to, to fool the FBI to fool them, and he was really the head of that crime family, you know, right? And so Lobo was trying to take some hits from him, right? You know, and so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that that is Lobo. That is Lobo and his introduction. He hasn't seen cartoon in 20 years. And they start having a conversation. This book, <clears throat> I try to do something different. And I think I did. I think I did. What I did was, if you take a look at it, even, even on this page, it's a combination of poetry and prose. It's a linear narrative, but sometimes the characters were, will break into poetic stanzas, and they will speak in that manner, and then the conversation will begin again, right? You know, so... Here, this next section from Puraneta that I'm going to read is Lobo a little bit later on as Cartoon is visiting him. And earlier I had mentioned meaning. And so here, Lobo has had time to reflect. What is meaning? What is this? Right? And so uh, this is on page 151. And Lobo says, <clears throat> remember, camarada, in this selva, nadie se salva. Lobo knew this as the only answer. A translation. Remember, camarada is comrade. Comrade, in this jungle, no one is saved. Okay. But I read and see what they're always trying to do, promising to do. Save everyone. I even read they're trying to come up with some shit called a universal basic income. Give everyone their basic needs met. But ain't no one gonna do that. Lobo rocked back on his steel stool. It, it ain't that we can't easily do it. With all the bullshit monopoly money we steal and invent out of thin American air. But it's that outdated Puritan hard work ethic myth that won't allow us to give people basic things like homes. Puritan. Pilgrim shit. Even though hard work is becoming useless because computers will always work harder and more efficiently than us, even if we ain't got to work, we still believe that the devil will steal us to sin 
if we're just having a good time. The upper classes, they ain't got to follow this rule. Ain't never follow this rule. Because it was always someone else doing all the hard work. Especially the blacks who built this country. But sure as fuck, the rotten dumbasses gotta believe in hard work. In pity, Lobo shook his head. They say I'm imprisoned, but it's them who's in cages. Shit, I'm better than them with their fancy meaning. Meaning? There is actually no such thing as efficiency. You were meant to waste your life. Your life, not any machine's mind, which has no mind. But the problem is that you're taught only stupid people stop and smell the roses because that is a waste of time. Smart people develop apps. I thank God for my blessing to always have the will and purpose of stupidity. Hallelujah! I'm still able to embrace my own insanity thank you for listening thank you thank you thank you wow that that's a lot that's a lot that's a lot of energy i'm just i i don't even know how i wrote that somebody else came into here and a whole bunch of different things happening at the same time you know right um i have one short section from <clears throat> the last complete novel that I wrote. This one has not been published. I'll give you a little bit of story regarding this one. That, that's one of my little doggies right there, you know. Uh, um, and uh, I wrote this during COVID, you know, right? And uh, what I did was I got the idea in August of 2020 or 2021. I think it was 2021. And I said, I'm going to write a new book and I'll, I'll just get it copied and I want to give it away as Christmas presents to loved ones. And so that's what I did. That's what I did. So I, I was able to write this book as Christmas presents, right? And uh, per perhaps here in the near future, this will be a, a book that's published. It is a story about, it is inspired by uh, Juan Ramon Jimenez. He was a Spanish author, Nobel Prize winner. And he wrote a book called Platero and I. Have any of you heard of that text? Uh, it, it's a story about a man and his donkey his silver donkey, and uh, it's about uh, uh, their, their travels and their story uh, in um, rural Spain in the early 1900s. So I've had these dogs for 29 years. I was uh, um, in the Marine Corps, I was in combat, and then when I got out, I was just off the hook, and I needed a good crime partner, a physically fit someone beyond words, you know, right? And so that's when I got my first American Pit Bull Terrier. And back then they still had like the ones that were fit and, and you know, that, that was back in 1994, right? And so, um, you know, I fell in love with these dogs. I raised my family with these dogs, you know, I still have these dogs, you know, right? And so, um, <clears throat> No, but the, the latest one I had to get, uh, her name is Chola. I, I had to go to Oklahoma to get her because they, they really don't have this breed around here. I got him in South Carolina, you know, right? But um, so, so this is a story about a homeboy and his American pit bull terrier wandering around the bay in the year 2020. So it's inspired by Juan Ramon Jimenez. I'm going to read to you the first section. Listo. <clears throat> Listo Love is the name of the book now, and the dog's name is Listo, which means ready, ready. Listo is golden red, 
like the sun in the desert. Red nose, red heart, hell heat. Ready. APBT. American Pit Bull Terrier. He is built like wood. Game bred roots from a soft seed grew into a tree of mighty limber branches. Man chopped down the tree, pulled down the sun, and carved it for his purpose. Life and death. Listo doesn't care about any of that. <laughs> he does what he does for what we can never understand. Full force forward. He is my familia and I love him even though I don't understand him. His very breath helps and heals me. Listo's coat shines like golden red glitter. His eyes are hazelnuts that look out into locura. He charges. I let him loose and he charges out into money green meadows. He races, spins around like a flying saucer, tumbles down and flips over and over onto spiky green grass in order to scratch his back and enjoy the day. He is a silly dog. On Sundays, he parades me through San Fran Frisco city streets, La Mission downtown, the TL North Beach. Around his bull neck, he wears a spiked collar that is almost three decades old. He pulls me as if he is hauling the heaviest hill and I must pull against his mountains of muscles. We play this game, this full tug of war, and he stops to sniff, always aware of things. I cannot see or smell, but he sees and he smells what is beyond truth. The people see this family, this brotherhood, and I'm proud that he has made me a star, even though I could never be him. He eats blueberries, raw chicken, and cheese, and this makes him strong and happy. Sometimes he looks at me with piercing, understanding eyes that break my heart. Maybe he knows me better than I know myself. He is altogether lovable with his chiseled cheeks and masculine muzzle, handsome as an atom bomb exploding. Thank you. Thank you. These words can only do so much. Practice of amor is more than proclamation of amor. Let's practice some amor together, everyone. How are you? What's up, huh? How are you feeling? <laughs> huh? All right? Okay? Okay? Uh, uh, l l let, me, let me invite you all to any kind of questions or any kind of comments, any ideas, any sharing you want to make regarding this. Anything that I've stated, please, and your name, please. I'm Rosemarie. Rosemarie. So I've read mm -hmm. parts of the book mm -hmm. from the beginning, mm -hmm. and um, I'm reacting more to your conversation today mm -hmm. about amour. I think of mm -hmm. it as love, mm -hmm. caring, mm -hmm. compassion, but the cruelty and where, how can you, how can your characters have, you know, this sense of 
connection. And just be so horrifically, dangerously, um, outrageously, deadly. I don't know how to go on. But Brutal, taboo, oh, it's ugly. Yeah, and yes. I, I'm just so puzzled by that, that they can profess all these feelings and behave so differently. Mm-hmm. I don't get it. And so, you know, uh, I've been asked before, you know, is this mm-hmm. fiction, nonfiction? Of course it is fiction because I cannot be these people that are mm-hmm. spiders on this page, right? Uh, uh, but, but at the same time, I know, I, I, I know about love and I can talk about amor analysis because I know very well what hate is and what ugliness is. Having grown up and been born and raised in the old Army Street projects and then moving out of there and moving out onto the streets by the time I was 10 years old. And in the midst of all this was the bloom of mass incarceration where I don't even understand why are they taking us off the streets, you know, right? In and out of juvenile hall. I basically dropped out by the time I was in seventh grade, Rosalie. And and so... uh, um, Even there, though, even there, there was light. And I would say, comparing and contrasting, you know, to a common kind of consciousness, right? And what is told to me is supposed to bring me some kind of fulfillment, some kind of happiness, right? Which they they never use the word love. They're forbidden to use the word love. Right, you. Uh, they, I would say all, 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 all of it that's out here, all of the words that they that they use. We could talk about all of the different systems, but it's not. It's not. The point is not to be just critical about it. The education system, the media system, the political system. You know, my own existential issues. Nobody's talking about the truth. And so they're trying to say, let's go be happy. And at at least we, like I was saying earlier, I I think when I was reading Pura Neta, Lobo had reflected later, like the gangster is like an American icon because they rebel. They kind of see the sham that's going on, you know, and these characters in Barrio Bushido, they could not articulate it out into the world. They felt so worthless. The reason why they're involved with such ugliness is because of the feeling of worthlessness and ugliness that they have that they can't express, that no one legitimizes for them. You know, right? You know, they know that they are shunned and they know that they're punished simply for being who they are. And, and, and so, 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 Rosalie, so even there, though, even there, and I, I, I think you could see some moments here, especially with, with what they believe is the ultimate essence of amor. They believe that that comes in the brotherhood of the gang, the brotherhood of the gang, right? And I understand this concept very well. You know, like I, 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 I have had many, many loved ones just murdered, killed, dead on the streets. You know, I was sharing with my class, you know, and I had not even shared it with them. It's been, I I think, three weeks now that I found out, you know, I I had seen him down in the TL, in the Tenderloin. He was a good brother, right? And, you know, I hadn't seen him in a a few years, and he was down there, and, uh, you know, he had a big smile on his face when he saw me, and I went and embraced him, and we chopped it up, and, 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 you know, I I helped him out a bit, and, and... for me helping him out, and this this is love right here. He pulled out uh, um, uh, what what do you these action figures? He had it in the wrapping. I don't, you all remember He Man? It was in the 1980s, the cartoon character. He had a He Man action figure that he was trying to hustle. You get what I'm saying? To sell. And he was like, hey, brother, let me hook you up and give you this. And I was like, nah, bro, you handle that, man. You handle that. You know what I mean? You know, you, you go, go sell that, you know, go do, do whatever you need to do, you know, right? But that was the last time I saw him. And now, now he's dead. Now he's dead. F- f- fentanyl. You know, right, fentanyl, I mean, just right and left. And so, you know, even in the midst of the most, and, you know, I already know what he was doing. You know what he was doing, you know, right? And I know what these characters are doing. And even there, there are moments. There are moments where I would say this. This is something, it's a philosophical point, but it's beyond philosophy. To step outside of the common consciousness and get into the taboo 
and beyond the taboo. It gives you like a second sight. And then when you feel something, you really feel it, you know, right? And so there are nuggets of amor that are embedded in, 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 in this novel. At the same time, I felt like, especially when I was writing it, I felt like I had to be true to the reality of what we were experiencing. And the reality of what we were experiencing was like uh, uh, machismo, um, violence, aggressiveness, uh, um, trying to be kind of over somebody, yet at the same time, notice here, in the midst of all that, also serving, serving each other when we could, when we could, right? And so, um, yeah, yeah, that, I, I guess, you know, that, that's my, my reaction to, to that. And so, you know, I, I would hope that somebody could read this, you know, and see that the, the, the characters are on this journey of exploration. What am I supposed to be doing? What is this? You know, what is this thing, existence, right? And, you know, and, and so I hope what I'm offering right now is an example and a practice of amor analysis. Because as I said earlier, I can make points about politics, about economics, uh, you know, uh, a whole bunch of social issues, etc. cetera. And th those things should be discussed. Those, we should be able to take those things out. But I know where I've gotten. I know what it's, where, what, what it's gotten me when my focus has been the spider symbols for power purposes. And I learned how to use the spider symbols. I felt pretty well. You know, I, I have a law degree. <clears throat> I have a law degree and I started a lot of good shit here in San Francisco, if you did not know. I, I've been part of a few things that uh, where we will we were able to to you know start some good shit with these things etc. And I was able to talk and make good arguments and counter their stuff and analyze it from a political perspective etc. etc. And I will tell you, three o'clock in the morning came and inside right here I know I'm still fucked up. Because I'm not offering amor. It's not about amor. It's about power. It's about power and manipulation and some type of solution where there is no solution. I, I, I offer amor as a solution and not a solution because amor is the spirit that's here right now. And there's no data to keep regarding that. How do we measure it? You get what I'm saying? Solution requires some kind of mathematical measurement that amor simply does not have. And I believe with this idea of amor analysis, I'm still teaching at the college, right? You know, I haven't really, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I need to like stuff it down my students' throats or anything. I don't even really mention it, right? I don't, I don't talk about my own fiction. But I hope that they could feel it, that they could feel it. Yeah, we, and we, we got a student right here, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, yeah, so... Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you for asking that. And I, 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 I hope, yeah, whatever I did, it's here. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. Uh, any other, uh, please, Joan, please. Okay. <clears throat> what about the, the way women are treated? Okay, yes, yes. Let's talk about that. And how could you write about it if you hadn't experienced it? Oh, I, I've experienced beyond any of this with males or female relationships. Yeah, it's it's been um it's been a journey of uh just uh d destruction and and love destruction and love and, and um the, the the women the women here let's understand they're coming from this perspective where they're supposed to be in charge but the problem is they know that they're not in charge of anything they know that they are weak and trivial, and they're putting on a persona in order to survive this existence with some kind of dignity. And let's understand this from a historical perspective. This is coming out of this specific attitude towards women is coming out of a perspective that was born because of mass incarceration. 
Uh, I, I've talked about this in, in a, when I when I used to uh, do presentations on the book. I haven't done a presentation uh, for a while regarding this, but let's understand that before 1986, 1987, actually about 87, homeboys would have love songs about their 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 significant others or their girlfriends. What happened here? Young men started going to prison. Their families got broken up. They felt humiliated, powerless, and they knew if they were going to be gone, they could not depend on anything. And so let's understand what happened. Once, once the grit and the truth of the streets, that is somewhat portrayed in the viciousness of what this is, you have the mass media jump on something called gangster rap. And gangster rap is telling the story. It is an authentic language that is used to convey what was actually happening during that time. And it was a defense mechanism. These, these rappers, they all had wives. They bowed down to their women, many of them. Do you understand that? But what happened was they started glorifying and romanticizing this violence that the mass media then used to blow up even further. And we became separated from ourselves not understanding how we were being manipulated like puppets. And, and so my, my point about this is, is they're speaking in this way because something has happened. Something has happened. Something else that happened too, and I've talked about this during different presentations, was is the crack era happened. And <clears throat> men, women started smoking crack, and then all bets were off. All morality was gone. And someone who was your loved one one day, the next day, they, they, they were on the streets. They were hooking on the streets. They were abandoning their children. The homeboys were pushing uh, uh, shopping carts, etc. Et you, you know, so, so all of this destruction that was happening, and they thought that this is the way that they would preserve their dignity by downgrading someone else. Yet at the same time, let's understand, I would argue that the characters, the female characters in this novel are stronger many times, if not most of the times, and forget strength. This is Amor analysis. More loving than the men. In this book right here, the main character, the main female protagonist, Maricela, is now over here. And what you will see in Pura Neta is Maricela is still a gangster girl, but she's aged too, and she's wise. And before Santo died, without her knowing it, she became pregnant with his child. And in this novel here, we see little Santo grown up. And so if you want to see a woman, a mother with love and strength and intelligence and wisdom, she's here in Barrio Bushido, but she's, she's just a straight up loca on the streets. And here now she's a full-fledged mother, you know, right? So, um... Yeah, that, that's what I, I, I would say about, about the gender dynamics. So, some issues of the gender dynamics that were happening during that time. And, and I don't mean that as a justification for any type of evil, right? Because let, let, let's, let's understand, this is the truth. I believe, uh, from my own experience and knowing how these things worked out, it, 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 it's what happened to many Many people and many young men had that in their minds. They're, they're supposed to be bees and hoes. That's the way we're, and they, we're going to pretend, ha, 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 that we believe that. But I talked about three o'clock in the morning earlier, right? What do you think happens at three o'clock in the morning? Thinking that bullshit. That shit ain't true. It's not true. 
It's not true. You know it's not true. You've just been following some rap that you heard and some other homies that are in jail that try not to let it bother them while they're in jail because they don't, they're, they're, their girl is gone. Right? And so, so they're, they're dealing with a lot of these different kinds of issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you. There's more thank of a you. comment than a question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that when you were, you were listing kind of the reasons for this kind of brutality, um, I, was, I, was, I kept waiting for you to say the word pain. Mm -hmm. And pain mm -hmm. seems to be so much mm -hmm. a part of it. Yes, yes, no doubt. No doubt. And, and there's, in that pain, I, I, would, I would say that there's an opportunity for amor in that pain. Because the, these are like purposely projected as some of the worst sinners you could experience. They're in pain. That's who love, that's who needs love the most. That's who needs, it's easy to love. I think we know that, you know, it's easy to love our loved ones. And when everything is nice and beautiful, etc., it's very hard to love people who are, who we think are so ugly, but they're still human beings. They're not monsters. Why are they like that? Why are we using, once again, I had used this term er earlier, this, are we using our common consciousness based on logic to come up with some formula that these people matter right here because we have the data for why they progress society and lead to evolution right here. And these people right here, they don't matter. They can't contribute anything. Why does contribution have to be some kind of uh, a point for compassion, right? And, and I, I had said earlier, actually, when I started out this, I'm not offering any type of solution here. I'm not offering any type of solution because I... I, I I think I would be vain. It, it, I'm still vain. Don't get me wrong, okay? Uh, uh, but, but uh, you know, I think I would be too vain to think that I have some kind of solution for all of this, right? And I used to believe solutions, uh, uh, progress, and all, all this stuff, and it's all just, I, I feel like manipulation and gets us further away from what matters most. And I think we all as human beings know what matters most is inside of right here, which has no explanation, has no words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if we made, made time already. Let's see. I, I, it, it, it is about that time, you know. It, but, but, but if Eric if Eric wants to keep us going, if anyone has any other questions or comments or anything like that, please, uh, uh, Merrily, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I didn't hear about your book until later, so I, mm -hmm. first of all, I haven't read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just met you for the first time today, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I see that you are coming from a perspective where you know both sides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, sides, I mean, two viable ways of living. And mm -hmm, you are mm -hmm. on, you will have an opportunity to explain one of them. And I'm just wondering how, I don't know how you participated in the, in the world that you wrote about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How you bridged that leap from that world into your world so that you are actually a member or could be a member of both worlds. Mm -hmm. But how did you bridge, how did you cross over so that you can now tell us what that world, what the experience is, what the reality is, and you can describe it apparently extremely well in your book mm -hmm. so i'm interested how you did that thank you for asking this violence was the bridge the mass media did not like our brand of violence but they loved 
that mass combat war violence. I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17 years old. And so I knew my brother was in Susanville at that time. <clears throat> And I knew I was going to be going, you know, to, to prison soon before, you know, uh, I only had to wait until I was 18. I was going to have to, I was going to have to go to prison. And this is the time period where you're supposed to prove your warriorhood by going to prison and fighting and joining the bigger kind of super gangs that were created because of mass incarceration. And then uh, uh, I was supposed to get killed uh, or, or die in some other uh, uh, manner. Right. And, and so many stories like that. And let's understand what I was doing on the street. Somehow, some way, I, I, I did not have a form. I had a seventh grade education, but I got into the Marine Corps. I'm the littlest guy. I'm not very tall. All right. You know, you got farm uh, uh, dudes from Oklahoma, uh, uh, Florida, et cetera, et cetera. You know. Right. And, 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 and you know what? The Marines saw something in me. They saw I was pretty violent. They saw that I was aggressive and that I could go and I would not stop. You know, I had box for a couple of years in the mission district. And so, you know, they're, they're seeing that and they like it. And I'm just, just saying what happened is they made me a squad leader. How, how could you make this dumbass kid a squad leader? He doesn't even, he's only 70 years old. And they love that shit. And then once I got into the fleet marine force and went into combat, you know, they, they loved me even more. And they gave me medals. Merrily, they gave me medals for things that they would have put me in prison for. You, do, do you understand what I'm saying, right? So that's the, if you really want to understand that bridge, it was the bridge of violence that then after four years, I come out and I'm just sick with it on the streets. I'm carrying a gun everywhere I go. I'm sleeping with a gun right next to my pillow for years. I was like this. You know, drinking, sleeping under cars. I did not care what I was doing. In one moment, I would just be violent. I was lucky that I never got busted for any of that shit. You know what I mean, right? You know, uh, uh, but, but, but what happened was, I will say, we were talking about it earlier, and Eric and I were talking about it earlier too, is one place that gave me an opportunity to go explore different things was City College of San Francisco. That was it. And I would not go to class because I would be too anxious to go to class. I, I would be feel like I would stutter over my words. So I remember that uh, at that time, uh, the library was in Cloud Hall. And I would go, I would cut class to go to the library stacks and just walk around the library stacks and pick books out and just start reading. And so that became a bridge too. And then as I said earlier, and I don't mean, I, I, I mean this, actually, you know, he looks like a little cutie right there. He's a puppy, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but um, uh, here, I'll, I'll show you his, his latest picture. Is th these are the dogs that really like, cause they're hella physically fit. They're hella slim and they're, they're you know, the, the real ones should be able to like be athletic and, agile and everything and I was kind of like that you know and I wanted to be like that and they they helped they were a bridge and and the, the, you know this book is really going into the history of the American pit bull terrier as well and is really an explanation of America right you know and that's that's the bridge was this thing that I, I love for its spirit but I, 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 I'm not about I'm not about that ugliness anymore. I hope I'm not. Of course, I'm a human being, so I'll I'll go there from time to time. And that's why I said just a moment ago, it's not just about proclaiming amor. I, I don't believe that because words are just words. You know, you got to go and practice it. And so I try to practice it. I try to practice amor in my everyday life. You know, I hope that's that's what I'm doing right now with you all. Is, is just practicing amor, right? And so, so that was a bridge too. That's a big bridge is there was little pieces from the professors, from the books I was getting, little pieces of amor. And, and also, but, but you know, I, I'd like to, I don't want to romanticize it either. There was the violence in the language too. Because how I was taught, and this is the way that we were taught. If you're in an institutional education, you use the words to 
Have a point. Have a point and be better than someone else. Your argument should win. And I bought into that shit. For, I used to teach like that. You know, no, no more, no more of that. I, I don't, I don't want that. That's no good. That's not going to help the students. I don't, I just don't believe that it's going to help the students. It's going to, you know, they're going to think, yay, I got it. I did it, you know, et cetera, you know, but it's, you're happy for a grade. What is it? It's a letter. You know what I mean? What, what's happening in here? You know? Yeah. 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 So thank, thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah. So I, I, I hope that helped. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think maybe that's it. Maybe we should cut it right there. And all amor to everyone here. Thank you for coming. Okay, blessings, all right? I, I hope we meet again, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah. goodbye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that, is, uh, um, it's deep. Is, that, is, is the book club going to discuss this? The first book, Fire of the Trito? Yes. We is that started, when is that? We started Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, the 25th, we began our journey through Barrio de Trito. Everybody should have the book by now. And you'll do that for a few we'll consecutive weeks? How does it work? Four weeks. Mm. We divide the book up. We read a section or two, could be two chapters. Mm. We discuss, and then... I'll be there. I'll be there and we'll talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and any questions you have, I'll reread Barrio Bushido as well and look over some other things. You know, when it first came out, I was doing presentations all over the place with, with that book, you know. So um, so I just got to get re-familiar with it again. Yeah, yeah. But thank you. Thank you all for reading it. Thank you for your, for, yeah, for your love for reading it because it is a brutal book. And, and I hope that the, ju that, the brutality is not the only thing that we get from it, you know, right? Some kind of understanding, hopefully some compassion, etc. But I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, okay. if you're hungry, okay. have a little something here to nourish you okay. before you go out. Um, you. Thank you. Your, your energy you. is so Thanks intense. I feel like I have to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one Thank of you. the things that would be really mm -hmm. helpful in our book group yes. is how oh, okay. you... Approach a book and discuss it, you know, as mm -hmm, a group. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have kind of a large group. It's very scattershot at times, mm -hmm. and not even specifically your book. But how do you get groups to talk about the character or theme mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or intention or what it meant to you? You know, there's so many possibilities, but we're just kind of lost with how we. Now, with this book, I. Just say bye. Hey, yeah. thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you, appreciate it. All right, please, come by, if you can, if you can. Yeah. I actually have some some lesson plans. Did she share? So, and I have some other, and, and you know, there's some videos where I'm discussing, I actually, no, I, on, on YouTube, where I'm actually going over each chapter. I just haven't, like, promoted them in a, in a long time. So these, that might actually help some textual analysis. I mean, you know, yes. we work, it works, uh -huh. but sometimes you walk away feeling like, you know, where are we with the book? What was the really? Mm -hmm. no, I'm not even talking mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. about your book. Mm -hmm. We've read about a dozen books mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and um, I think it can be better. That's what okay. I'm okay. So All maybe right. if you can keep that in mind, I will keep that in and, mind, and, and then I will just say, yeah, I have some material. How, how, how about? How about Amor analysis. In yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's about yeah. Amor analysis? Yeah. I think that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. You do, huh? Okay, okay. Huh, huh. I know that place very well. 375 Woodside. Oh, in San Mateo. Oh, I know that place too. Hillcrest. Right? Yeah, yeah. Hillcrest. Yeah, I remember that place. Yeah. I spent my 16th birthday in Hillcrest. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you know what, though? But at the same time, Offer on more analysis. And, and then you know what? I remember in the juveniles, I did presentations in the juveniles before, and they were uh, giving out Barrio Bushido. 
they, they would. would. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's sold out right now, though. You know, so, so it needs to get reissued again. It, let me give you my card, and then I can get copies. I, you know, let me know if you think if you think it's something that the youth. You know, I think it could. I think it could be. They've talked to me before. I've done it before with them. You know, okay. Pero mucho gusto, mucho gusto. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I have everything right here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. What's happening, Zane? Huh? Damn, bro. I'm so glad that you came well, through. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are, are you catching the bus now? Oh, uh, I was still yeah. Bart. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay, yeah. right, right. I mean, you just haven't been here around yet. You had seen the... Um, yeah, I saw the email. The email. Uh, uh, I just finished working on them, like, I don't do anything today. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. it would be really okay. cool to go see. How do you feel about it? Uh, uh, I'd be one, too. Well, I haven't asked to give prayer. I know it's one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm I'm just give her a book. You want me to give her a book? Well, here, come out of your inventory. Yes, and write about Marilyn. I haven't read it yet. Hi, what are you doing? You guys have to have you read. Lobo going from a very similar mindset to, like, something that I've had in the military. Is that right? Okay, okay. But, like, uh, seeing him as, like, behind, uh, the bulletproof glass and, like, turning to people day, bringing it up to people all the time. Mm -hmm. I had a very interesting, like, I wrote I would love to read about. Brother, I have a, I have a copy right now of Huda Neto. I would, I would recommend it. Yeah, I do. I'll get you Body of Bushido, man. Because, like I said, it's, it's actually a sequel. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm and, and it's it's a it's a quicker read too because I, I throw in.